Hi, I'm Michelle Olivier, and you're listening to Hey, I Want Your Job, the podcast that looks at amazing jobs and what it takes to get them. Welcome to Hey, I Want Your Job. And this week, I really do want your job. Like, Natalie, if you just want to send that this way, girl, I'm in. I want all of the things about your job. But mostly, I want to be cool enough to be able to have your job. So let's context. Natalie, what is your job title? Sure. I am the Division Director for Race and Gender Equity Advancement at the YWCA, as well as the founder and principal strategist at Glad Ed Solutions. And so those are my job titles. And that is a lot of words. So many words. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie, what do you actually do that, and you can focus on why I'm jealous as all get out that you're able to do that. What do you do? Right. It sounds way more exciting than I think it is on a day-to-day basis. So I'm sorry. It was like, oh. So I, I do administration work a lot of it, but it's administration work over cool stuff. So I will say that much. Okay. And with the race and gender equity work, I help develop our economic programs. And so we have a lot of programs that are targeted to help women start businesses, to get into tech careers, savings, buy houses all those things that help people get advanced economically, especially during these times uh, of COVID. I also oversee our family wellness programs, which really focuses on breast and cervical cancer. So screenings, education, helping people that have been diagnosed with cancer, as well as our race and gender equity work, which has sort of a, a big sort of wide range of community outreach, some internal work, as well as our global education, which is for kids. And so that is probably the the cooler of the two titles that you were referring to. So I think, actually, I'm an HR nerd, so I actually dig all of the things that you do. But I definitely, like, I'm most excited personally about, like, the DEI work and the, the equity in particular. And I love that your focus is not on the diversity It's on the equity. And I feel like that is the piece that so often gets neglected. Like we worry about Kumbaya. We worry about brown people being like on the company photo, right? And we forget about none of that shit matters if we don't have that big E like sitting in the middle of all of it. Like I, and so I think that's fantastic. When I've, the people that I really admire that I follow that's been on the show, Farzan Farzad talks about it as social justice rather mm-hmm. than DEI. And I think that that's, I like that because I think that it's, it speaks to the, like the need for that, that equity glue in there. So I think that's amazing. Anytime I have somebody whose focus is equity, I always have to ask one of my pet questions. So okay. I warn you in advance. Mm-hmm. One of my personally held deep-seated beliefs that I hope that someday people are going to actually listen to me (laughs) when I tell them is I genuinely, in my heart of hearts, core of cores, believe that we cannot fix paid disparity in this country until we practice radical transparency and literally put on the door what every single person actually makes, actually takes home, because until we do that, it's all smoke and mirrors and lies, and you can't expect people to compete if they don't know what the rules of the game are. That's what I think. You set me straight, Natalie. Yes, you're right, basically. (laughs) That's my favorite answer. (laughs) So that's that's definitely um, a part of it, because pay equity is one of the, the things that we can really talk about. And so a lot of times when people sort of address pay equity, they come at it from um, an upskilling perspective of 
let's give individuals more tools in their tool belt and therefore they'll be more qualified and be able to get the additional pay. But the, the problem is when things are held in the dark, it's easy to not fix them. And so the, the transparency piece is so critical because when you have it basically on front street, like you can't hide it. You can't say, no, I'm not doing this or yes, we're all equitable. It's either put up or shut up a situation where you got to put your numbers out there, show really what you're working with, and then be able to, to, to stand behind it. And the, the horrible thing that I really hate you talking about getting your skin is when employers ask for payment history as though your value of what you're going to do and your skill set is based on what you've done or maybe what someone underpaid you in the past. <laughs> oh, you've been underpaid in the past. So let me continue to underpay you moving forward as opposed to stopping and saying, okay, here's our organization. Here's what you're going to do. Here's your skill set. Here's what we can do. And let's figure out a, a payment based off of that. And so it, it holds, it holds groups back. I love the, the tying in because I, I'm kicking myself mentally that I hadn't previously made that one-to-one -one connection in my own brain. And it's so obvious when you say it, that when we ask people for their historic pay, all we're doing is in the moment you ask that question, you have also just said, we don't give a shit about equity because mm -hmm. all you're doing is reinforcing the historic wrongs that have been perpetrated against that person. And I, given how I feel about resumes and interviews and all of that kind of stuff, Nellie, I cannot believe that I think this is literally a light bulb moment for me, but I thank you. Good golly. I have, thank you for that. So <laughs> I think that that's, that's super true and super important. And I love that. So you work with the YWCA part of the time. Yes. Part of the time you're out healing the rest of the world. Yes. So talk to me about the healing the rest of the world. What, when you're out and dealing with other clients, et cetera, because you do public speaking yes. as part of um, your work. When you're out and doing that, like you just, I just had a light bulb moment with you and one that I shouldn't have just had. Let me be clear. Like I should have known that. Right. But what, what kind of pushback, what are the light bulb moments that you're bringing to people? What's the feedback that you get when you're out in the field? Yeah. When I'm out working with other people, just a, a real quick of what I do is I really work on company culture, right? Helping organizations to basically support their leaders in the type of culture that they build for their teams. Uh, a lot of times you know, it's really those frontline managers that sort of build how people feel when they go to work, how much, in, how engaged they are, you know, how burnout they, they eventually become in their organization. And so when I'm out in the, in the world, talking to people about employee engagement, retention, burnout, all these things, a lot of things that I hear are, they're putting these issues back on the employees. Oh, it's your fault for not knowing how to manage your stress or not realizing the the systemic issues people deal with and the you increased burden. You need to burden. set better boundaries. <laughs> yes, in their lives. Or you know, let's let's do some yoga and meditation and that will heal all your problems. Like I, just, I literally heard that yesterday. It was just like, I had to step back and just take a breath. I was like, okay, we're not going to talk about like the stuff that's happening within your organization that's causing this. It's a, a lack of ownership of responsibility. And for you, a lot of great leaders, you, you own every part of the process. Like you don't put it off on anybody else and say, oh, that's your responsibility. No, if someone's not feeling engaged, they're not, whatever situation is happening, I'm going to take ownership to do what I can do to make or help them be their best. And so if you have things going on outside, family issues, something happening with your child, I still want you to be the best in the situation. And so I'm going to support you in any way possible to do that. And so I think from an equity standpoint, we don't take those things into consideration where we're talking about individuals that are dealing with equity issues because it, the CDC just finally said that racism is a public health uh, issue. That means that it is constantly weighing on people of color, women, LGBTQ communities, like a lot of people that 
experience oppression within our community are constantly feeling this weight on them on a regular basis that impacts their their mental state their their physical capabilities and as leaders employers they need to understand that they need to create a safe space that supports individuals to be able to navigate through the world and still be able to do their jobs as best as possible and so a lot of people they don't want to hear that they want to say the employee needs to do it all I think that's so true. And I, I heard recently a quote that has really just resonated with, you hear these quotes from people and you're like, that, that's what we've mm -hmm. been trying to say, that the, the hardest job in the world is being poor in America. Mm -hmm. And we forget that, especially the further visual clues like racial differences, gender differences, physical disability differences. Yeah. We have reminders, but the socioeconomic difference, the further up we go, the more we forget how hard it is at that place. And then mm -hmm. when you have a other factor on top of that, right, you're a minority and a single parent and all of those things, uh, it's incredible. I, I, was, I was talking to somebody the other day who, they're not below the poverty line, but She's a teacher, so I think we all yes. know that's too close to the damn poverty line. Am I right? It is. It and is. they got it two is. kids, and she, she was telling me that her apartment hasn't had hot water for three months. See, that's my face. And I was like, are you – what? I was like, that is illegal. You yeah. should call the – and she was like, and then what? What am I going to do? Call the state? Okay. And then what? They come in and tell them they have to do it, and then they give them 90 days, at which point I'm another 90 days. But in the meantime, I'm the one that called the state. So now believe nothing in my apartment's going to get fixed. And she was like, and worse than that, this place is a dump. What happens if they show up and then they close it? Mm -hmm. Now what? Now I got to find somewhere for me and my family to be. I don't have the money to do that. I literally cannot afford to fight for the rights that you're absolutely right, yeah. I should have. And I just, I heard that, Natalie, and I just, w my mouth just fell open, right? I'm pretty, I try to be pretty good about checking my privilege, all the flavors of it, right? Mm -hmm. But damn, like, she was right. Yeah. She was the most in need of protecting at that moment and literally nothing she could do. And of course, like that impacts every other thing in their life, right? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine trying to have two kids and be a full-time worker, et cetera, and not even be able to have a hot damn shower at night yeah. or to bath my kids in a hot bath. Like the level of things that we take for granted is mm -hmm. remarkable and remembering exactly what you're saying, like how much of an impact that makes every single day on our life is, is huge. How do you help? What do you say to the hiring managers when they, when they have those moments where they're like, that hadn't occurred to me. You got to leave your personal stuff at the door. I'm not paying you to worry oh about your God. kids. Like how, how do you coach through that? So <laughs> those are, <laughs> <laughs> those are those are interesting personalities, which I I hope are a dying breed as we're moving forward. You know, I can pray and hope and wish. I, I usually try to bring it back to something that they can relate to, right? Where a lot of people that have that that are hiring managers that are you know, executives are usually exempt, right? And so they usually have some time off to deal with their own personal issues. Whereas if you are an hourly wage worker, you don't necessarily have those same privileges. And if you don't work, you don't get paid, you don't eat, right? And so I, I kind of try to remind them that there are, we're whole people, right? And then I, I take them back to like, have you ever had a, a morning where your kids decided they didn't want to get out of bed? They didn't want to get dressed to go to school? They missed the bus. You had to drop them off. Then maybe you had to stop for gas because you didn't fill up the night before because you were rushing home for something. And then you found out your mom got sick. And then you had to come in 
to work with all these things weighing on you, rushing, um, things not in order, family issues, like, how do you feel? Like, can I tell you that you aren't a whole person that doesn't have experiences don't, that don't impact your day to day? Everybody is a whole person. And so as much as we would love to be like, leave your personal stuff at home, you can't tell people to leave part of them at home. And there's actually an exercise that I do where I um, have people to, to list their, their identity. If you're a woman, I'm a black person, I'm a mom, all these things, boom, 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 right? Your whole self of who you are. And they usually list about anywhere from 10 to 12 different identities if you know, I help them through the, some of the things. And then they'll, I'll tell them, okay, take that, cut it in half, right? You can only be six of those things, right? And we're like, okay. They, they can usually do half, right? Six. I'm like, okay, the six, cut out half more. You're only three of those things. Those are the threes you, you got to throw away, right? And then, okay, now you can only be one of those things. And then once you get them, them to realize that, oh my gosh, I have all these different identities that I would love for people to respect to see me as a whole person, that all these things are weighing in. They make me who I am, right? We're not these sort of single things. We are an intersection of a lot of different identities. And because we're an intersection of a lot of different identities, all of them experience the world from different viewpoints. And because of that, that's what makes us who we are. And you don't want people to, to only bring part of themselves to work. I mean, if you want to throw some psychology in it, it actually takes a lot of mental strain for them to hold back. So when you tell them to leave their personal stuff at home, you're telling them to use some of the brain power that they could use at work to hold back part of who they are. And so they're, you're not getting their full capability anyway. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a walking through process to, to get them to relate to it and to see it from somebody else's point of view. I love that process though. And I love that you, I love that activity of the like, now cut, cut yourself in half, cut yourself in half, cut yourself in half, because absolutely you are always all of those things. And I think mm -hmm. that I can see that really resonating with some people. Obviously there's going to be some, they're going to be like, I never have that. I'm always, and you're like, Psh, friend. I think one of my favorites, I was doing a training on how not to be a jerk as a manager kind of thing you're talking about, just more bluntly phrased. And we were talking about the need to accept that everybody gets to have a bad day. And I had one of those managers that was the, he's never been wrong in his damn life, Natalie. And you, you leave you at the doorstep and nine to five, I own you and you're what I tell you to be, guys. And I said, you're telling me you've never had a bad day. You've never had a day where your personal impacted. No, ma'am, I'm the same every day. Okay, at which point his buddy turned around and said, are you kidding me? <laughs> if you don't get lunch on time, you're an asshole. And he was like, I mean, I just need a Snickers bar. And he's like, are you under the impression that you yeah. work the same when you're hangry as when you're not? And, and then the two of them, they kind of like joked and they got into it. But like even something that small, right? But just having, I think for me, the lesson in that was if I can get their peers to call them out, instead of me trying to call them out, if I can make it such a basic damn level that you can't get around it and then yeah. have them call each other good naturedly, obviously, mm -hmm. it's the most effective, but it's not easy because, and so bless you <laughs> for walking that really, really exhausting line all the time. So to get to get do all of these things, one of the things that you have done that is extra sparkly and impressive, of a long list of sparkly and impressive things about you, Natalie, is you've given a few talks. I have. One of them on a stage called TED. I have, yes. So let's talk about your TED talk. What that's a major pain in the butt for anybody who doesn't know, just getting to do, they don't just 
hand them out. Like it's a thing to it's get thing. on that stage. You got to want to do it bad enough to jump some hoops. So mm -hmm. what was your talk and why was it such a passion for you that you had to get up on that stage? Yeah. So it was the insanity of exclusion in STEM. At the time I was working for the university, directing a pretty large STEM grant, helping underrepresented students finish their beginning classes so that they can continue on and graduate with a STEM degree. A lot of things that we saw were that kids were either switching out of their major or dropping out of college altogether. And so they have these big hopes and dreams of wanting to to be an engineer or be a doctor and then they get to the university and like reality kind of like boom oh you didn't take enough math in high school oh you're not this you didn't have this experience they just didn't have a lot of experiences and weren't prepared for what those colleges and universities were going to throw at them and i saw that and i saw people had to to give it their dreams at such a young age and it, it kind of hurts to, to see an 18 year old be like you mean i can't do that i've taken chemistry three times and I can't get anything above a 50, no matter how hard I try, no matter how many tutors I have. And it hurts for them to, to, to come to that point. And it's like, how do you stop that from happening? How do you continue to allow people to have dreams and move forward into what, you know, their heart's desire truly are? And I, I came up with this idea that we need, I called it like a, a mentoring pipeline or mentoring chain where you if you are a STEM professional, then you should be mentoring college kids and what they need to do to get into the profession. If you're a college kid, you should be mentoring high school students to understand what they need to be successful in college. If you're in high school, you need to mentor middle school students about what they need to do to be successful in high school because you got to start off high school right if you want to get to college. And middle school math is really where most STEM careers start. And so there's a lot of support that needs to be had early on but the best way to connect with kids are finding someone that's a little bit older than them that can show them the the way slightly and my whole thought process is if we just set up this system where we just help somebody right under us and encourage them to do the same then we can create these mentoring chains and pipelines that are going to get more underrepresented students into stem because in reality what's represented in stem now been the same and so we got too many problems going on oh my gosh what a surprise we have too many problems going on in this world to have the same sort of perspective the same sort of thought process we need some some different ways of thinking and different individuals looking at this problem from different perspectives to really come up with some new solutions to these problems and so that was my thing we keep doing the same thing and we want different results and that's just that's crazy we gotta do something different i feel you and yeah. I love that idea as well, because as much as my godson is a skinny white boy, he absolutely, he loves science and he loves engineering. And that has always, since he was little bitty, his favorite thing to do is play scientist, right? Oh, <laughs> don't get excited. He's 15. I he do. I'm anymore. sorry. I have a STEM background. So yes, I'm excited about it. I yeah. yeah. It. He ain't cute anymore, Natalie. Let's be clear, right? And last year was, he was a freshman in high school last year, and it was, it was rough. It was rough mm -hmm. for all the kids. Yep. Some more than others. My God, some is definitely in the more than others camp on the rough. Mm -hmm. And as a result, though, he failed a bunch of classes. And I was like, yeah. before I kill you, what were you thinking? He's like, oh, it doesn't really matter. And I was like, stop. What is your plan after you graduate from high school? He was like, we'll probably just go to the University of Texas. I was like, not anymore, you're not. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. what do you mean? I was like, buddy, you just got three Fs on your transcript. I bet that is not about to happen. Mm -hmm. UT Austin is not mm -hmm. an easy place to get into. Yeah. That, that is no longer, you have just written off a whole tier of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And he just sat there and looked at me, Natalie, and then he cried. And he was like, and I'm like, he's like, I, I didn't know. And mm -hmm. I was like, ah, 
I call a little bit of bullshit. I'm like, I've known you a while now, kid. And I know that I have explained to you that when you get to high school, there is a different level of ramification. Mm -hmm. Your behaviors have, they start to impact where you can go. And just, you're talking about, I hated to shit on this 15 year old kid's dream. I don't know how much of a dream it was. I feel like it was a path of least resistance in his head, but like, I had to turn and be like, that's not going to be a thing or you're not going to mm -hmm. go. You're not going to go to any top tier school. Mm -hmm. MIT. No, you Texas, yeah. No, like all of those are no, unless you like freakazoid go and knock the SAT out of the ballpark and get a perfect score. But he's Even not that. that kid, Natalie. He's. Yeah. I, I know everybody knows, read an news article or has an uncle's cousin's brothers twice mm -hmm. removed, what have you, that did a thing. I get it. They are the exception that proves the rule, right? Yeah. And, but I think that your point about that pipeline is so true and so appropriate here because I think he didn't listen to me because I'm old. And so grownups are always talking to kids and it just gets that mm -hmm. blah, 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 right? Yeah. But when another kid says it, and especially if they say it over and over and over again, uh -huh. that just, it has a different level of resonation. And I think that that's true for, for all young people. And I think that, I, I just, I think that you're a genius. I think that's a great idea and I hope everybody listens. So you went on TED, yeah. genius idea. Then what happened? Did the whole world turn around and say, Natalie, let me throw money at you to come solve this problem? And 50 million people knew your name and you went on Oprah and it was like, is that how it went? Not quite. But you know, I, had, I had been doing the work before the, the TED Talk, trying to create this, this system and this pipeline of getting kids in, into the STEM fields. And so before that, I had actually worked on an actual pipeline. And so with you know, grad students and college students and high school students trying to give them different opportunities within STEM so that they can feed into different programs to, to move through the, the pipeline a little bit more. The, the best thing that probably came out of that was because at the time I was in New Mexico that, and a couple of years later I left, so I don't know if they continued it, but they got together with a lot of stakeholders trying to to move the the conversation forward of having different individuals work together i think that's one of the the worst things that happen to anything are these silos in every industry right but i was focused on stem and stem education and so i was trying to get the university to talk to we had a lot of national labs as well as you know, our local science museum of community stem education and then some of the the k through 12 groups and so i was like we got to get together work and figure out how we can support each other in getting kids through this pipeline. And so we came up with a, a few different projects, one of which was a career fair for high school students that focused on healthcare careers. So a lot of kids, they want to be a pediatrician because that's kind of all they see and all they know. <laughs> but there's more in healthcare than just pediatricians. And no, you do not have to see blood to go through and have a healthcare career. And so there's like a lot of misconceptions about healthcare. <laughs> like you can still go into healthcare and never see an ounce of blood. Like you could, you can do that. And just to open up their eyes to all the different possibilities that are out there. And so that was one of the, the things that, that kind of came from that as well. So not throwing money, but at least it, it brought awareness to the issue a little bit. Well, I, I wish that they threw more money at you, but I'm glad that there was at least awareness. Mm -hmm. So that the throwing money part brings me to something that I, I struggle with as a woman. And I know that it is worse the further down the skin tone chart you get, which is people expect women in particular to do work for free. I cannot tell you how many times I have people who come to me and they're like, hey, I just want to ask you a quick question about negotiation or, Hey, I have this interview coming up. Could you just help me right quick with interview prep? I'm like, but you know how that's how I feed my kids, right? Like my fee schedule is very clear and on my website, 
go right ahead and you yeah. pay and then we'll talk. But it is, people get shirty and you mean you're just in this to make money? Like you, well, again, that's how I feed my kids, right? Like little bastards want to eat every day. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, More than once, right? Right? <laughs> uh, and so I know that's bad for me. And I, I genuinely struggle with towing the line between being a nice human mm -hmm. and being paid for the subject matter expertise that I have. Mm -hmm. How do you handle it? Fix me, Natalie. How do I tow that line better? <laughs> so Lead by I don't know about fixing. I, I feel like I'm, I'm in the, the pool with you. Okay. <laughs> where I, I struggle with that too where i i want to help individuals because uh, there was an organization i was working with and they were like yeah let's just sit and talk about it and then so i sent them a proposal and then like they just went silent and dark and then hired somebody else and so i was just like okay so we're just gonna get some information from me and then just take it and run and some of the things that I've done is to, to limit the time that I give those individuals. And so I give them a nugget that they can find again on the website or anything else that they read, some of the work that I put out. And then I say, okay, oh man, I got a, a meeting scheduled next. I can't stay, but if you like to dive into this more, I'd love to dive into this more. I'll send you, you know, some paperwork, some proposal, and then we can set up a formal relationship to, to move forward and to, to really get at the, the root of this. Because I want to give you the time necessary to, to really figure out how to do this. And so that's the way I go about it is I just, we're only going to talk about this for so long. And you know, after about 15, 20 minutes, you can't get that deep into any particular topic. And so they can't get that much, especially if you start off with some niceties and like, how are you doing? And how are the kids? And so you do it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always what's really hard for me, right? Because I genuinely, I don't work with assholes. I'm pretty, pretty blunt and at, on the list of my, my colleague has a, a list of shit Michelle says. <laughs> that one is a reoccurring theme. Like I, I just don't like I, I, life is too short. So mm -hmm. as a result, there is that kind of like the how's your mama and them kind mm -hmm. of conversation that goes with it and lines can get blurred. And so I feel you. And then the same is true that like my heart goes out to job seekers or that aren't in a position to pay for our, our services. And again, a big part of what my business partner does is say, Michelle, we can't keep giving it away. <laughs> <laughs> we have to charge people at some point. I'm like, I know, but also like they've been out of work for nine months and she's, yeah. and then, so they should have come to us at the beginning when they had the money, shouldn't they? Like we can't keep making everybody else's problems ours. And then on the flip side of the desk, when I have the hardest for me, Natalie, and you can mm -hmm. tell me if this speaks to your experience is when you have a hiring manager or like a people manager, they want to do better, but the company's not bought in. They want your time to know how to not be the problem and the company won't pick up the bill. And I just, I just, I, that's the one that's to me the biggest conflict, right? I have somebody mm -hmm. here trying to be part of the solution. Yeah. Um... But I still got to eat. I definitely feel that. And so their task needs to be really working on their their leaders, their CEO. Because in reality, if there is an organizational-wide issue, that means that there are probably policies within their organization that even if they were able to figure out how to get these people hired, are you going to be able to keep them? Because it's an environment that's not going to be warm and inviting and eventually is going to push people out the door because of the culture that's in that organization. And so framing it that way, there's a deeper issue that even if you and I like figured this out and I figured out what you need yeah. to do, like 
you are going to still turn people away. And so everything that we did, all your efforts of getting these individuals in the door will not have a lasting effect if you don't get at that root of the problem within your organization. You got to get your your leaders on board to, to be able to, to get at that problem. And I think going back to the whole, your focus on equity being so important, I think that that's a big part of the message from my perspective is you as a one-off hiring manager cannot fix the equity issues in your organization. Yeah. You can fix, you, you have influence on diversity, you have influence on inclusion, certainly. You do mm -hmm. not have influence on equity. Yeah. You might have some influence, like you could recommend, but you can't fix the problem. And yeah, I, I, I agree, but man, it's, it's a hard one. Hard. It's a hard one. I, but encourage them, right? They're, they have their moments in their organization where they can yeah. speak up and they need to, to be that, that advocate, that ally in those situations and not just say, oh man, it's my, my bosses or my organizations or cultures point of view. No, if you see that's a problem, then you have a responsibility to speak up and to say where and when that these things need to be fixed and be that advocate. If you really feel strongly about it, be the advocate in your organization to say, hey, this needs to be changed. We need to figure this out. We need to go and hire Michelle, like whatever it is that, you, that we need to do. Stand up and speak and say, here's the problem. Here's what needs to happen and be that constant sort of person saying, hey, how do we do this? Even if they just start off by trying to find other like minds in their organization, mm -hmm. let's say, hey, let's start a diversity committee. And as you start to get some more people on board, it's not just you. And then you all can become advocates and allies and begin to speak to the truth in your organization. And it will begin to start to slowly trickle moving forward. And you from a, a business case, you come from that point of view, especially for individuals that aren't necessarily about the, the morality of the situation, which I understand they're out there, but they still got to change. And so by any means necessary, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the, the, the finances of it. Let's talk about the legal issues of surrounding it. Let's talk about the protection, the perception of the organization, all these different reasons why. I think a lot of people just say, DEI is just the right thing to do. Yeah, it is. But there's a whole slew of other reasons to do it too. And if you have any issue, I'm going to have a reason behind research-based with numbers, with calculations behind why this is a good idea and why we need to move it forward in our organization. I love all of that. The only proviso I would give is please don't try to hire me to fix your DEI. I am not a <laughs> DEI expert. <laughs> if you want my help with fixing the issues in your recruitment process that contributes, <laughs> I got you, boo. Otherwise, I'll help you with I help Paul you with Natalie. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We'll work together. But yeah, other than that, absolutely. So before we started filming, you and I were having a lovely chat about something that I, that is near and dear to my heart at so many levels. And I made you stop because, not because it wasn't interesting, because you're too interesting and I wanted it to be in the podcast. And this is something I feel like we can just probably the rest of them just write off. This is going to be what we talk about which is about the idea of framing and how you use your voice. I'm going to say my piece and then I'm going to shut the hell up and I'm going to let you talk. Okay. As a woman, I have spent most of my career being told to sit down, shut up and nod. Mm -hmm. And I'm not very good at that. Natalie, you may have noticed it's not a strength. And so really I've been told she's so competent, but she's just not very nice. You're too much. You're too bossy. Ugh, you mean that bitch in recruitment? Got that one a lot. All of this stuff, right? Like people respect you, but they don't like you. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I am at a place where I am old and contrary enough that I have stopped with probably 80% of the framing. 
do I drop an F bomb in front of a CEO? Depends on the CEO. <laughs> Not on the first date, right? <laughs> but after we get to know each other, probably. But mm -hmm. I don't lead with that. Like I I'm polite. I right. best foot forward kind of stuff. But I am always pretty unashamedly me. You were saying that you frame things in ways that are digestible. And I know that I have a lot of privilege with my pale skin that I can say a lot of shit you can't and not have to worry about being branded as the angry black woman. Yeah. So that's my experience. That's my take. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let you talk and you tell me what you think about framing. Sure. And I was telling you a little earlier that I was told that I was the, the queen of framing things. Um, <laughs> to give you a, a perspective that, again, is palatable for uh, whatever the situation is. And I think it has to do with a lot of things. So, yes, being a woman, being a woman of color, but also the, the space that I'm in. When you're in DEI, uh, it can get sensitive sometimes. And there are some just scars and these trauma that we as a nation are, are holding in our society, which in turn are bred in us and what we watch and what we read. It, it's like everywhere, right? And so when you begin to start to peel away and try to get the gook out so you can actually heal the trauma, people resist. And so what I don't want is them to resist. I want them to be open to the transformation that's necessary for the healing to take place. And so to do that, I have to be very aware of the words that I use. And so I often pause and think, is this the best way to say this? Not necessarily because I don't want to say it the way I want to say it. If you <laughs> put me in the right situation, I probably will. But because I know my end goal is I want them to be transformed. And so I will say it in the way that gets me to my, my goal. And because I, I want that to happen, I'm like, if I have to say it in a nice fluffy way, as opposed to that, these, these policies are just racist and you need to change it. That's <laughs> like, what were you thinking? Like, really? Which is what I would like to say, but. Say what I say. <laughs> But, but some people, they shut down when they hear that. And so I don't want them to shut down. I want them to understand that these aren't the, the best policies, especially as we have a new generation of students coming up that have a different perspective on the working world. Don't roll your eyes. <laughs> but it's the reality. It's still the truth. Just blame Gen Z. That's what I heard. You blame Gen Z. But it's not just Gen Z because it's also the, the stats behind it of who you empower and there's a an entire workforce that has talent that we aren't leveraging and so we want to make sure everybody's included and they're giving their best and so there, there's a lot of of reasons and i have this whole business case behind dei that comes from multiple perspectives that i run through when it comes to policies and why a particular policy isn't as supportive as they may think it was or it may have been at the time of creation and that's another thing that people need to understand is that as time goes on, policies need to be reviewed and updated, no matter like what organization you're in, no matter what it's about, you got to review it and update it. So this is the time to understand what's necessary to help your organization grow and be better. And like I said, I don't want them to shut down, but I want them to change that thing. Oh. I agree. I also, I guess for me, part of it is I feel like as a consultant, part of what they're paying me for is to be the person who says the emperor has no damn clothes. Mm-hmm. And so part of what they're paying for is for me to walk in and be like, this shit is racist. Why the hell are we doing that? Mm -hmm. And that and that if they didn't expect somebody who was going to say it about like that, I was probably not the consultant they should have hired. Um, Because I'm real transparent about that's how I do things. Now, I also hear you very clearly that if you are too abrasive, you shut people down. And I guess what I would say is that if I'm doing a training, if I'm trying to communicate a message to 
more than the people that are paying me to to tell them the emperor has no clothes that I do modulate. But I think that it's still one of the hardest things about growing up and, and, and becoming a mature professional is finding an authentic voice mm-hmm. that is still appropriate. And that's not about DEI or anything else. I think that's just about human. Yeah. But it's really hard. And I know, like I said, for me, I know some of the empowering moments for me that helped me do that. Mostly it's the fact that I work for my damn self. (laughs) So I know I'm not about to get fired. I'm in with the (laughs) boss. But for you, because you do so much work coaching young people and young professionals, what advice do you have for them in terms of how to find that professional, genuine, authentic Mm -hmm. skin for them to live in that is professional? So I think they really need to understand their, their why, like what's their, their North star. Like, why, why are you doing this? Like, why are you in this field? Um, why are you in this organization? What's, what's the point of all this for you? What's your, your day to day. And when you understand why you're doing things, it makes sort of dealing with some of these issues that happen in the daily world more palatable. I know that I do what I do to support women getting the resources that they need in a society that unfortunately does not value pay or respect them us as as we should be and because that is my focus always is how do i get this for the women how do i get this for our clients how do i support them when it comes to dealing with individuals and different perspectives that aren't on the same line as the way i want it to be i'm always thinking about okay In this situation, how can I get out of it what I want for our clients? And so when I keep my clients as the the forefront of my thought, it's like, okay, you are a roadblock, but you aren't going to be the roadblock to me getting my clients to what they need. And so I'm going to figure out how to either get around, go through, over, under, whatever, you to get to what I need. Maybe take a taxi and go all the way around so you can see me. But I'm going to make sure that I am focusing on my clients. And so I think as you're trying to find your authentic voice, you got to figure out why you're, you're doing stuff. And when you realize why you're doing stuff, it, it makes a lot of things easier as to what's important, what's not important, what's the fight to be had, what's not the fight to be had, because you know why you're doing what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. I love that. So I have a question that goes along with that about something that's had a lot of press recently, and I'm really interested on your perspective. Code switching is, it was never on my radar. Not surprising, all things considered for the Melanin Challenged, but it, I had never noticed it until it became such a talking point in our Mm -hmm. kind of community. And in my head, I think it is bullshit that anybody should feel like they have to do that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you want to talk, present, however, because that's how you prefer to do in that context, it's none of my damn business. Mm -hmm. As long as you are doing it out of your choice and not because you think that's the only way to communicate with me. Very specifically, talk to me about code switching. Like what, what is your your experience, your take, all of that in the current, and, and how does it fit in with the current objectives? Yeah. I was told that and taught that at a, an early age, right? So you do this in front of one group of people and you don't do this in, another, in mm-hmm. front of another group of people, right? And it, it becomes just a part of the way you operate because that's how you're taught how to survive in the world. Like you just don't do this in front of a different group of people and chastise if you do it. I mean, it does come from, we've had issues within society that if you behave a certain way, you get punished. And so it's a a means of protecting kids as they grow up and become adults to be able to navigate in a safe way through society. And so it has a root of, of safety. And so it's not 
just for the the fun of it, like there was a purpose for it. There still is a purpose yeah. for it, right? For the the most part, I don't necessarily do that as much as I can. I I say what I want to say, even though I frame it, but I frame it for everybody, whoever I'm talking to. I frame it for my kids. Like <laughs> that's just like the the way I am. And you know, I've been in situations that were like oh you're a little too ghetto and the other one's oh you're a little too white and it's just i don't know i'm just me i can't <laughs> i'm gonna just can't. show up and you can take what you want from yeah that. <laughs> i i personally don't have the bandwidth to to code switch like that i know some people do and they're really good at it and those that are really good at it i see the progress that they make in their careers that's the problem that you get positively reinforced for being good at it. So it's not like it's a, a thing where, you know, oh, you shouldn't do it. Hold up, though. You get rewarded for doing it. So why wouldn't you do it if you get rewarded for it? But I, like I said, I personally just don't have the, the bandwidth for it, which is why in some circles I just don't do well. And uh, <laughs> I just kind of don't. And so I find my tribe who feel the way I feel that have a lot of different experiences and just feels and behaves the way that they're they're used to that makes them comfortable which i think is why you and i probably get along so well but yeah. but it, it's definitely something that has been around for a very long time yeah i don't see it going anywhere in all no. all reality i and just hate something... it like i just hate i hate that it's just so so damn wrong that you should have to change your it, to affect a different speech pattern or behavioral pattern in order to be rewarded because it had you're the exact same person irrespective of those mm -hmm. types of trappings and i don't know i'm trying so hard to like work with my clients and coach them through this kind of stuff. And I can't tell you how much I hate it when I get a feedback on a, a person of color from an interview and they're like, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about their communication skills. And I'm like, it, that's always, oh really? As mm -hmm. soon as I hear that on a person of color, I'm like, we're gonna need to get some real like that doesn't just because they're a person of color does not mean they have great communication skills. They're crappy communicators of every color <laughs> by all <laughs> means. But we just, for me, that's always a, I have to pause and investigate that. And I, I struggle cause I just don't like, I don't know how to say it's safe. I don't know for the, the people who feel like they have to code switch. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how to, to teach recruit like hiring managers and that's other than stop being a, a jerk about it like the fact that they use vernacular the fact that they use more comfortable language rather than being super formal doesn't make them a bad communicator it just means that they didn't use the words you would have used and mm -hmm. they're not the same thing but it's really it's it's such a complex issue and i i guess to me it just still baffles my mind how long I went living so comfortably in that privilege of never even noticing it. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. What advice would you have for, because I have been asked and I came up with a big goose egg, organizations that want to make it really clear that you're not, that that's not necessary or an expectation and um, that they want to make it clear that you can come as your best self you want to use vernacular you want you don't need to try to change your accent and all of that kind of that that code switching is not particularly rewarded other than just not rewarding it which is yeah. the best way like how to indicate that i have no idea so i i think you can tell when you walk into an organization and if you see everybody being their authentic self, which means that everyone should be a little different, right? Yeah. Because 
we're not the same. So it's going to be different. But if you walk into an organization, everyone speaking the same way, dressing the same way, that there's a culture where there's an expectation that you behave and speak and present yourself in a very particular way. And so if an organization wants to, to make that apparent, then they should start with themselves and what they, again, what they allow, what they support, what they reward. If I see people, I, re I remember an organization I work with that uh, there was a director who basically spoke Spanish and there, there was like some communication issues with English to Spanish, but they were great at their job and it was okay that they spoke Spanish and didn't speak English. You know, that let me know that you could still be good at your job and not necessarily have to have or fit into some mold. But if everybody's fitting into a mold, cause you can see it when you walk into the door, it makes me wonder like what is going on within this organization. Organization, you gotta be aware people are can pick up on things when you walk in that door. Like how, what's the culture? How, who's sitting at the front desk? Who's in the back office? How are people connecting with each other? Does anybody say hi to each other when they walk past each other in the hallway? There are a lot of micro interactions that are happening that we pick up on as individuals that stem from our culture and how we feel we can represent ourselves within that culture. And if people don't feel like they can represent themselves in that culture, they're not going to. And people coming in the door are going to be able to see that. What I heard, my takeaway from that is that when I am in an interview and drop an F-bomb, I'm doing them a favor, Natalie, because oh, I, I am that. making it clear <laughs> that I, that in this culture you do you and we're cool with it like you don't have to pretend it does say that to be it does say that not. yeah it really does say that it and is you a know, clear communication of non bougie is still rewarded here so yeah to some extent that that's true in some interviews that that I give because sometimes I'm the, the hiring manager too I yes like you said I speak in vernacular and a little bit of slang because I would have said that anyway. And so just because you are now the interviewee, I'm not, again, going to change the the way I, I'm speaking to you. And I joke about the F-bomb, you know. but I think that even things like people will come in and be like, and we'll be talking about something and I'll just be like, well, that freaking sucks. And I'll say it exactly the way I would have said. You can just watch mm -hmm. you know, the pressure valve getting yeah. released a little each time, especially because when, you're, when you are the hiring manager, you or the, the interviewer in general, you have that power. And the more you're setting that tone of, I'm going to show up authentic and I want you to do the same. Yeah. Definitely. I think helps create that. So I, I think that is, that is good advice. I'm going to tell everybody more F bombs. That's, that's my, that's going to be my advice. And then I'm going to, when they ask me why I'm like, y'all should talk to Natalie. She'll explain. She's a, <laughs> she frames it better than me. She's the frame queen. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> we are almost out of time. I but before know. I have to let you go, and I am disappointed because I, this is fun. What have I not asked you that I should have? I guess just some of the, the projects that I have on the horizon. And so I don't think we got to. Tell any... me about it. We're going to have sure. all of the links to you and all of your stuff in the show notes. So do not worry. People yeah, yeah, who yeah. are as impressed with Natalie as I am, I'm going to make it really easy for you to find her. Do oh, not worry. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. But other than that, hit us up with a few details of exciting things you have going on that people should know about. Sure, sure, sure. One of the wonderful things I actually really want people to, to know about is that I'm actually going to be doing a, a free training coming up in December. I know. Uh, I was like, only because of the topic, I was like, man, you I just really got done talking about not giving it away, Nelly. No, I no. feel like I need to take you to task on this. But it, it's part of a strategy. I will say that much. Okay. So, okay. Okay. All so right. it's not, it, it's purposeful. And the, the topic is basically being a better ally. And so okay. we're going to dive deep into a little bit of DEI and what individuals can do to be that advocate that we talked about within your organization. And so that you can go forth and make the, the world a, a better place. My friend, uh, I have a good friend named Madison who 
One of her go-to statements is Google is free, y'all. Google is free. Please stop asking black women to Google for you. <laughs> so this is your, Natalie is offering a session. And so that's one of the points. For but free. Well <laughs> She's done your Googling for you. You can show up. <laughs> Don't ask your, your coworkers, basically. That's one of the points. Don't ask them. So <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Don't Step ask them. one. Yeah. Quit expecting every person who doesn't look like you to be your like go to yeah. point. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I am excited for that. I'm gonna sign up. Where do I sign up? Go on our LinkedIn page. It, it's posted right. there um, on the Glad Ed Solutions page, and all the information uh, on how to register is on there. Okay. If I accidentally drop an F bomb, you're not going to kick me out, are you? No. <laughs> all right. Yeah. No. I will shut up and listen instead of talking over you, but I am excited. Genuinely, I'll come to that. That's exciting. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have loved every second of this. I am excited to, to come to your training and take part of your, your free wisdom. Thank you for that. And thank you for mm -hmm. your humor and being awesome today. I really appreciate it. Had fun. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to, Hey, I want your job. For more information on how you can get your own awesome job, visit ONH Consulting at www.onhconsulting.com. We offer incredible resumes, no-nonsense career advice, and real-world tips for landing a job in today's market. Check us out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Insta for more insider information. Soon, you'll be hearing us say, I'm Michelle Olivier, and hey, I want your job.